Um, massive technical issues at this end, um, and we lost everyone. So we're going to we're going to rerun the session from the start. Well, I'm hearing myself twice for some reason. I think that's better. Is it? Can you hear me? Okay. Thumbs up. Yes, you can. Good. Thank you. Um, so first of all, welcome to Graham Wright. Um, Senior Manager of Environmental Research at Daikin UK, I believe is your, your title now, Graham. And um, also recent winner of the RSC Cooling Awards Gold Award for your outstanding contribution to the industry, Graham. Many congratulations on that, very well deserved. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. So, today we are going to be looking at um, opportunities for um, heat pumps. I'm not seeing a slide there. There we go. There we go. So, we're going to be looking at um, opportunities. Um, for heat pumps to be a part of the UK's net zero ambitions. And um, we've all seen a lot of negative publicity in recent weeks, um, which accelerated after the, the, the government's heat and building strategy was, was finally published, largely with the media focusing on environmental issues because of the COP26 uh, summit, which is running just now, obviously. Um, and this slide here shows the, um, the temperature readings in 2018, which was one of the warmest on record, of course, and, and these mean temperatures show show the, the, the situation, the critical um, situation, should say very clearly. The committing um, climate change gave us two scenarios. One where we have a maximum increase in temperature of one and a half degrees C, which is seen here in the top graph as the low emission scenario. And the bottom on the high emissions was a was a um, scenario of um, four and a half degrees temperature rise. So um, clearly we have um, major issues. So as I say, with the COP26 um, coming up and the heat and building strategy, which created a lot of talk about, about heat pumps. And we, we, Graham and I and many others have been trying to push heat pumps for, for many years and trying to really push the agenda and get the conversation going. And what's been really unfortunate has been negative publicity in the media. So um, I focused on one here, which was uh, newsreader John Humphreys, when he was slating heat pumps in the media article and saying how his house has never been more than lukewarm. And it's sadly um, pretty typical of the rhetoric of, of the past week. And, and today I'm, I'm hope that Graham and I can debunk some of the clutter in these conversations. Um, debunking myths is, is sometimes a hard thing, it's sometimes a very easy thing to do. And, and in this case, with John Humphrey's case, and his column in the Daily Mail, it, 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 it was actually quite an easy thing to debunk. When you delve beyond the headline, you realise that what he's actually talking about was an old derelict cottage in rural Wales which he had renovated for use as a part-time holiday home. And reading between the lines of the article, I found myself questioning whether an air-to-water packaged monoblock heat pump was actually the right thing for his property anyway, um, and in particular with the expected use as a part-time holiday home. Okay, he says he installed um, underfloor heating pipes, and uh, he also said it has stone walls still, and he claims that these walls have state-of-the-art insulation, whatever that means. But the big giveaway reading between the lines for me was that he said he needs his neighbour to come into his property and switch on the heat pump a couple of days before he arrives. So because he's using this heat pump very infrequently, all of the thermal energy that he's putting into the building when it's occupied, it's allowed you to seep out gradually out of the stone walls. So then each time he goes to use the place, he has to get that energy, the heat energy back into those walls to prevent that heat loss. So it has to be replaced every time he decides to visit for a long weekend. So it's it's no wonder really that he has um, high energy bills. I had a similar conversation with uh, with a chap uh, just the other week as well. He assured me he was trying to do everything right. He has an electric car and he got a heat pump put in his holiday lake cottage. So a very similar scenario. But he told me that the families that rent his cottage are never satisfied with the temperature and that his energy bills were astronomical. So I explained to him how an air to water packaged heat pump actually works and, and also crucially how an air to air packaged heat pump works and how that, that in all likelihood would have actually been a better option for him. 
And this is a problem we come across a lot. The trouble that we find is that the overwhelming majority of firms who are called out to look at installing heat pumps don't actually touch air to air because they're essentially heating and plumbing firms who are really just dipping their, their toe into the renewables market. And the heating and plumbing uh, engineers, they frequently don't understand the design setup and running implications on the household or take into account infrequent use, oh. such as these two cases that I've mentioned. Now this graph from the Heat Pump Association, which was part of their roadmap uh, to net zero, it demonstrated the need for 600,000 heat pumps that need to be installed annually um, if we have if we any um, hope of actually achieving the net zero targets. Now, the Heat Pump Association roadmap was a, was a great um, starting shot across the bows, I think, for government. And government have largely stepped up now. Um, they used to, they're talking the right talk, um, but they're also putting the money where their mouth is. Um, Bayes recently funded um, sort of about 1,500 places on the Bayes Academy Heat Pump Installers course. Um, and this is a course that's designed mainly to upskill heating engineers so that, as I say, they can properly understand how to set up and hand over to the client an efficiently operating heat pump system. And therefore, the owner will understand how to use it efficiently going forward. And I know the Heat Pump Association have developed a similar course, which is run via manufacturers training centers for exactly the same purpose. It's all about getting the education out there so the engineers who are installing these things actually understand what it is that they're installing. But the whole debate actually opens up a whole a whole other set of questions. What actually is a heat pump? Is this a heat pump? So what we see here actually it's a water source heat pump system that's installed at Queen's Quay and Clyde Bank in Scotland and that's using the year-round stable temperature of the River Clyde as a heat source and that's and that, this system actually supplies a huge number of properties with their heating needs. Now personally this sort of thing is, is my preference for most of the country longer term. District heating networks um, supplied by heat pumps. I saw a few years ago, I was over in Sweden and I, and I was very privileged to be shown around um, a, a district heating um, a plant in Stockholm, which has a, the biggest heat pumps I've ever seen in my life, there's enormous heat pumps. But what they also do very cleverly in that plant is they, they bring all of the sewage system from central Stockholm back and they recover an enormous amount of waste heat out of the sewage system, which can then be transferred via the heat pump into the, uh, the district heating network. So it really is an incredible, uh, incredible uh, success story. So what about this? Is this a heat pump? Well, you can probably recognize this is a, is a packaged uh, domestic uh, air to water monoblock system. So we're seeing a lot of them around uh, the country nowadays. And what about this? Well, these are um, VRF and uh, air conditioning systems, so they will have reverse cycle heating on them, possibly with heat recovery as well, particularly in the multi-split or the, the, VR, the VRV um, type systems. So clearly this is a heat pump by any normal definition. And the problem that, that, that we find is that when we hear the term heat pump being used, the speaker is referring only to air to water monoblocks, and we get this frequently talking with government whenever they talk about heat pumps they're only talking about one specific type of heat pump and, it's, um, and, and, and this is the reason why we have so many systems that are poorly designed or poorly installed and this is why we get all this um, negative publicity and, and, and the term heat pump is often then used in disparaging terms. So from my perspective for our industry, our sector, it's really important that we take back the narrative. We need to make sure the listener has been given all of the facts and that they start to understand that the type of heat pump system they may need may not be the same type that the local plumber is trying to actually sell to them. When I think back to the holiday cottage scenarios, I can see a far better option that may have actually been a centralised air conditioning system with reverse cycle heating, because the warm air makes the occupant feel comfortable long before the building has stabilised, avoiding the switch on for two days before John decides he wants to grace Wales with his presence, and avoiding the need to run the underfloor heating at an inefficient temperature level. We've seen a lot in the media as well recently about the uh, Insulate Britain um, activists uh, and they're, they're, they're screaming for government to pay for, for increasing the insulation levels in homes. But what we're finding is the buildings are now being over insulated quite frequently and with the over insulation of homes these days we can um, we're seeing um, sorry the over insulation of homes 
we're seeing an increase in uh, respiratory diseases and asthma attacks, and that's one of the side effects of poor indoor air quality. So by using a packaged air system like this, an air-to-air -air system, we can actually use it to introduce outside air, fresh air, um, by filtering the outside air, because sometimes the outside air quality isn't particularly good. But we can actually introduce that outside air, which, which enables air changes in the home or, or, or any building. So we end up with healthier homes with renewable heating that actually works as intended without the high energy bills. And I, I know this kind of design was, was quite prevalent in the, uh, in the 70s but the heat pumps were quite inefficient in the 70s and what tended what people tended to use was an electric resistance heater battery to to actually raise the temperature to to an acceptable level the, the efficiency of the heat pumps nowadays the reverse cycle air conditioning heat pumps is, are so good that we don't have that issue anymore we don't need to have the electric backup heating this um, next uh, this next image here is, is a kind of typical example of a, of a, um, a multi-unit. So multi-split air conditioning system uses a heat pump is an also an excellent option. You're only providing the heat in the rooms where it's needed. So if you have a family home and the kids are off the university for weeks at a time, for example, and then they come home unexpectedly to do their washing, as my kids did when they were away at university, then you're not having to heat that bedroom for those empty weeks. When you have a, a, a a centralized wet system in the home, the radiator often get left open. I know you can put thermostatic balance on things, but they often get left open. So you're heating rooms that aren't being occupied and it's, and it's a waste of energy. But of course, by using a multi split like this, you're not having to heat those empty rooms. And then when an occupant does come home for a long weekend, they can heat it up very quickly when they come home and need it. So there are many benefits to using this type of system that are often overlooked. And so it's important, and it's also very important to remember that there'll be different requirements from home to home, from office to office, retail outlet to retail outlet. There is no one size fits all solution. And it's really important that when we're looking at heat pumps and helping us to achieve net zero, that we're all looking at all of these options so that we're selecting the best fit for the occasion. Um, I have a slide with some interesting stats here that Graham provided um, showing how building insulation has changed over the decades. So the, the U values you can see over the years have um, have improved dramatically. So the heat loss through walls and roofs has obviously been slashed from what we had when I was a kid, certainly I well remember drafty homes which clearly had awful insulation. Um, but now that these improved insulation U values um, are obviously bringing down energy bills and, and preventing waste heat, um, it, this also having a serious uh, and significant impact on the nation's health, as, well, as I mentioned, with indoor air quality. So one problem solved is actually creating other problems um, uh, very often. So, um, Graham, if you would like to come on, I've just got a few uh, questions there to point to. I and mean, I think from my perspective, uh, I think when we've talked before, hopefully you'll agree with me that the air-to-air -air, um, air conditioning with reverse cycle heating is, is often a much better option than the monoblock that's, that's often being pushed forward. Given the right circumstances, Graham, absolutely. I, I think one of the problems that we have is we, we want to try and pick winners. In fact, we need all the solutions. Uh, dom looking f uh, predominantly uh, air towards heat pumps, which is what the government are basically doing, is, is they're taking our heating system that we've currently got, adopting a heat pump to it and making it work. Well, it, and quite clearly, it does work. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but it doesn't fit everywhere. Um, and one of the things that we have very clearly noticed or have seen and, and in that data that you showed is, is temperatures are rising, insulation rates are rising. So the size of your heat pump or inside your heating system is actually going to reduce. And to ensure that we get the right balance in people's homes, we need to make sure the right ventilation is in there. And dare I say, even some mechanical cooling when it gets really hot outside, because, you know, at some point or other, that, that is going to be needed. And there are homes in London at the moment where temperatures in the middle of the summer have been in the 40s. Um, admittedly, mm. that's the ex uh, uh, an exaggerated one exception. But it's uh, it's most definitely happening in some places, and those those houses, those apartments are virtually inhabitable in, in, in the summer. You know, you just can't mm -hmm. live live in those temperatures. Mm 
So, so there needs to be a, should we say, a bit of a, a more pragmatic approach. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go around giving the government the cane over what they've just done because I've worked tirelessly in the same as you have over the past years to actually see heat pumps become what is going to be the de facto heating system or for the future. Um, and and I, let me also make it very clear, there will be other solutions in there. So, you know, district heating, um, the kind of systems you were looking at and you mentioned in Sweden, absolutely must play a part in what we do. But probably for the majority of people's homes, it's going to be some form of heat pump. And whether that's air to water or whether that's air to air really depends on what kind of house it is. And I agree with you, John should have put an air to air heat pump in there. It'd have got a far better mm. result out. Yeah, yeah, he certainly would. He certainly would. Um, I think one of the, one of the issues that sometimes comes up when we, when we talk about about the solutions, and particularly we're looking at uh, thinking about district heating networks, we we have a mentality in the UK as homeowners that that we like to have our own system in our house, and that's partly because that's what we've all kind of grown up with, with having our own heating system in our own dwelling. Um, and obviously, the, the the idea of a district heating network introduces a concept of someone else is actually controlling the supply of the heat, and we may have local control of how it's actually delivered. But it does kind of need a bit of a mindset change, doesn't it, for for homeowners to be able to really adapt that? Yeah, but it's not a, it's not a new idea. Uh, if you look no. at Battersea Power Station, look across the river to the housing estate in Pimlico, that was powered or heated by. Uh, by a Battersea power station in, in the in the sixties and seventies, you know there were housing mm. estates in South London that were heated by by great big boiler complexes. So it's, yeah. this isn't new. It's just the way the generate way you generate the heat will uh, make the difference. And yeah, quite clearly, mm. yes, people will have uh, heating device devices and be able to control their own heat, heat in their in their buildings and their homes. But you know we just need to go get away from this idea of each of us having our own control or having our own heating system, because all it really does is it creates a myriad of CO2 emitting devices. Um, yeah. And, and that, that doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, it, this a fact. I mean, I saw something earlier today about ventilation or, um, on one of the sessions earlier. You know, we've been using certain types of uh, ventilation systems and they work really well, but we stopped doing it because they just got a little bit too complicated to use. Well, actually, we need to go back to the way it was. You know, we're not reinventing the world. We just need to make sure that we we use all of the tools that we've got in our toolbox. Yeah, absolutely, and and, and use them in a, a more joined up thinking kind of approach to, to the whole thing. It's like I say, it's not new technology. I mean, heat pumps themselves have been around for I don't know 60, 60 years. I know certainly my, my father talks about and um, he was installing heat pumps in Bermuda in nineteen sixty one. So it's it's not new, not new technology at all. But. Um, I think I know certainly when you know when my dad was a young engineer in this in this trade and, and, and installing heat pumps. As I mentioned it in the presentation, there's there was an issue back in the 70s where the efficiency wasn't actually high enough. So the air off temperatures wasn't sufficient with the refrigerants that we were using at the time, and that meant that, that they had to have electric uh, heater batteries. And I think the electric the, the cost of uh, of the electric heating was was actually quite a bit lower than it is today uh, as well. So it was. Kind of seen as an acceptable way forward, but you know we've we've moved on so much. The technology itself isn't new, but the way we're applying it has has moved on leaps and bounds, hasn't it? So the efficiencies that that, that you as manufacturers in particular are, are able to to produce and provide to the contracting sector uh, is, is going to have a huge influence in in that. But obviously, we need to we need to get the message out that these are the most efficient systems. Yeah, and. Um... It was it was interesting to see when you picked up the the picture of the uh, VRF systems and or VRV systems, whatever they were, um, 25, 30 years ago. A good number of those have been cooling only, but every single one of those mm -hmm. is a heat pump, and we get, we get very high efficiencies out of uh, those systems for heating and cooling, mainly because we focused on, um, uh, shall we say, the technology that enables enables to transfer the heat. The compressors have been specifically designed to work with these systems. Um, and the, the electronic controls, and one of the issues you always had back in the, well, I mean, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, I, didn't, I don't quite go back as a 60s for a bump, but definitely in the 70s and 80s, is we had a few mechanical devices to make these things work. And mm -hmm. quite clearly, the controls weren't necessarily up to up to the uh, the task. Today, well, the sky's the limit, basically. I mean, we, can, we, we we've got processes in these things that have got routines that understand what's going on. Your average heat pump has got something like, 
two or three pressure transducers and something like about 10 or 12 temperature de devices in there so we know exactly mm -hmm. what's going on with the system we can tr trim it we can make it work in, in whatever way it needs and we can obviously adjust the speed of the compressor so yeah this goes across all of the all, all the technologies that we, we, we're using whether that's air to water air to air or or any, or any of the other devices we're looking at even some of the larger capacity systems and when i talk about larger capacity i'm talking about a thousand kilowatts which in terms of a heat pump isn't big i think the one you were talking about in sweden was about 50 gigawatts um and yeah. it's an enormous machine it's not it's not just one it's obviously several of them but you know those kind of things will have so many controls on them we, we can actually tweak and, and, and adjust them so that they, that they work just right <clears throat> providing we match it to the load and that's the yeah. other issue is that <clears throat> in many respects um we've adopted a technology that's very forgiving if you oversize it in fact it's probably better oversized than it is sized correctly whereas a heat pump it doesn't work that brilliantly well when you when you oversize it it will work but it won't just work as effectively or as efficiently as it can mm -hmm. so there's many homes 35 kilowatt boiler that probably only have a 10 kilowatt heating system and the rest of it's there for the domestic or water demand mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you, you mentioned as well um about obviously the over insulation and, and cooling being required and a bit more frequently you mentioned about in a number of properties in london for example that they need to have cooling at least for a few days of the year and um, one of the things that we've, we've really seen a lot of in the last year and a half obviously is is the prevalence of working from home so you know, obviously it was forced upon us and um, you know march april last year and to some some to some degree it, that's obviously gradually um, eased off to, to allow people to get back to the office and the, the round table session we had at lunch time today was about the future of the office and the counter side to people obviously not going to the office is that more and more people are working from home now they may of course be used to working in a nice air-conditioned office so they, they've become used to that i think the uptake in domestic air conditioning in the usa was because people were they had an air-conditioned car they were an air-conditioned office or, or a shop that they worked in when they got home they were used to the air conditioning and they needed it um, so with that same kind of mentality moving forward um, it would obviously make sense to have uh, the air-to-air -air systems to give you that flexibility wouldn't it and particularly for, for um, city centers yeah I, I, yes you're right i mean you'll be amazed how many homes of these days in the city are, are air conditioned by all kinds of different types of system this this move to home working or hybrid working which i think um I, I, you, you get different versions from me i listened to the, the session this afternoon you know some people can't work in the at home some people can only work in the office mm -hmm. i think there's going to be a bit of a, a a gray area but but in essence you're going to get a lot more people working at home uh, during uh, you know during the heat during the summer where they may want to have some kind of cooling in there i mean i think the the first thing is is if you can ventilate it ventilate it first to make sure it's cool that way if not you get yourself a, a system that is uh, suitable for the room or the rooms that you need to, you, need, you need to keep cool um the mm -hmm. whole connection between cars and the environment i mean actually you see if we go back to spain back in the 1980s they had a very low penetration rate for a domestic air conditioning they've got it in their cars within three or four years the market was boomed and now it's the standard mm -hmm. and you know, in many respects, you can see us building homes in the 2030s and the 2040s that will have integrated heating and cooling in them. I'm not necessarily moving away from air or heat pumps. They may be doing it that way, but they may also be looking at an integrated ventilation and heat pumps uh, to type, type system that you know, gives you the best of both worlds. And let me be very mm -hmm. clear, yeah, there is there is a hierarchy of cooling, which is basically you know, shade the room if you, don't, if you can, ventilate it if you're still too hot and then only introduce mechanical cooling if you have to um, mm. and it has to be the way things are because again you know you end up with a situation where you you're not don't want to burn energy unless you absolutely have to mm -hmm. yeah i mean you're right it's saying an air to water system doesn't have to be heating only it can actually cool you can you can have uh, um, fan coil units for example instead of traditional radiators which you know that some of these actually look really really nice for the for the home and, and that way you get that benefit of the cooling as well as the heating don't you um, so yeah i think that is definitely a way forward but one of the you need, looking at it you need to be careful. Sorry. sorry i was going to say you need to be careful with that kind of system because mm -hmm. generally you have two pipes and the last thing you want to do mm -hmm. is take 35 degree water down to about 12 because all you do is you're burning energy before you get anywhere mm -hmm. 
I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I've seen systems do that on, from a commercial perspective. Yeah, um, so that's, that's very true. Trouble. So go back to DX refrigerant. But I, I will say that because I'm a fridge engineer, so I've obviously got a clear well, bias. <laughs> um, just looking again then at the uh, for retrofitting. So we we get a lot of negative publicity about retrofitting of of the air to water packaged heat pumps, and in particular because people tend to be looking for a for a straightforward like for like replacement. So when they're um, the traditional gas boiler packs up, for example, and, and you're looking at just replacing that with an air to water and heat pump system. But obviously, you know, we've seen that, again some of the negative publicity has come about because we have people that have got micro bore plumbing on the on the radiator systems, for example. And when you're trying to apply a heat pump with a low flow temperature on the micro bore, you're just not going to get that thermal capacity into the radiators to to actually get the right heat into the rooms, are we? No, you're right. And unfortunately, our building regulations allow developers and builders to use that kind of system where, in fact, um, it was probably about the worst thing they could do um, in terms of a system in, inside someone's house. So when you're faced with that um, as a homeowner, you're going to end up having to replace, replace your heating system for something that's actually going to have something on a reasonable board. I mean, there are ways around it in some, some places, but in, in essence, it was about the worst thing we, we could have done as uh, done done as, an, done as an industry for heating. New building regulations hopefully will um, resolve that. I mean, there'll be some some kind of statement in there about flow temperatures of fifty five as being a maximum, uh, possibly, or it may even be a some kind of um, balanced flow temperature. But but in essence, it would move move developers and install uh, and heating installers away from micro bore systems into something mm. that you could put a heat pump onto. Well, that, that is the aim of the new building regulations. In essence, it doesn't matter what your heat emitter is or heat, sorry, your heat, heating device is at the beginning of your building. At some point, it will be changed, probably to a heat pump of some sort. And the last thing we want to do is to have to change your radiators or your insulation rates. So mm. it's one of the reasons that the heat pump industry are really focusing on new build now. Um, the mm. retrofit market will come. Uh, there's no two ways about it, um, but but in essence, if we could start to put in 300,000 homes a year, with, all with some kind of heat pump in or alternative heating device from a from a boiler, um, I think we're into into a win situation. And you mentioned that 600,000 mm -hmm. a year. Well, you know that's got quite that, that is quite achievable. Um, mm -hmm. Just need to get need to apply our, our nose to the grindstone now and get it done. If you know what I mean. And the, 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 yeah. fact the government accepted that target, which originally came from the Committee on Climate Change, I have to say, um, mm. as, as being as a good target and a million heat pumps by 2030. So there's no letting off the gas pedal once we get to 2028. You know, it's it's going to be it, it's it's going to be a good time to be in this industry and also a good time to be in the heating industry. Mm. Yeah, indeed, and I, I, I certainly I've seen I've seen a marked increase in the the chatter amongst the heating fraternity on. The likes of Twitter and stuff like that as well. There's more and more of them are, are actually getting how it should be done, which is, which is really good, good to see. Um, as I say, so at the top, there's been a lot of negative publicity in, in the press, and um, a lot of really wild um, estimate figures for for fitting heat pumps. Um, I, and I do think that a lot of them are stemming from the fact that that in order to get the design right, you're having to look at um, you know stripping out the pipes and upsizing the radiators, like you say increase in the insulation in homes and i think the trouble is that when when people are having to do all that yes that's going to have an enormous um, up cost to uh to um the, the project itself but as you say you're looking at the new build and obviously you're building all that in at the build yeah. stage so that you don't have that um and i mean look at the cost most, there's two the things yeah, mm -hmm. look at them as two distinct sectors. That the, the do build, they should have the right amount of insulation in. They should have the right pipe work size. They should have the right radiator size. It, mm -hmm. It's just a slam dunk for putting a heat pump in. Um, the refurbishment market is something completely different because, in essence, you may have to change your heating system. It's not normal, but you may have to. Um, mm -hmm. You may have to put some insulation into the rooms. And again, it's not don't look at the whole building. Look at each room individually. Some rooms you may have to. Some rooms you may not. Um, and then obviously you put your heat pump in um, with whatever's whatever's necessary. I, I, I've seen some silly estimates. I've also seen some very low estimates and some very high estimates. I think there, are, there has to be a recognition though from the from the heating um, 
uh, which we say, shall we say, heating installers and designers at this moment in time, they've not really done any way of heat of heat load calculations for the properties they've heated. They've just put a boiler in. Now, I'm not yeah. being overcritical about it. That's the fact of the matter, and that's what it was. So, you know, there's, there, there, there is that. Uh, but if you actually start to look at heat loads within buildings or heating loads within buildings, it is yeah, very clear that you can reduce the amount of heat, heating capacity that's needed. Um, and it's mm. then just a matter of dealing with the domestic hot water size, size of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and, and hopefully with the uh, the upskilling courses that, that we've, we've managed to kind of bring to the market in, in the last year will, will certainly help to, yeah. to, to drive that forward. So, um, yeah, I think that's a good a good message to end it on. Um, clock rapidly running down. So um, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Um, so thanks again, Graham, for joining us. Um, uh, hopefully um, people who logged in early will manage to get this uh, recording or have managed to come back online for the rescheduled session. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for joining us. And I um, hope you have a, a good day and uh, join us at the conference again tomorrow. Thank you very much.